Well, good morning. Lovely to see you. Uh, a particularly warm welcome if you're visiting with us. Um, I do just want to issue a little apology for being away a bit recently, traveling around, and uh, actually I've got a trip overseas. I won't say where because we're being filmed uh, just coming up in about a week's time, but news will go out about that, and uh, I would covet your prayers when uh, going. But anyway, uh, this morning we are carrying on our series of the Holy Spirit through the whole Bible. And um, last week, Andrew got to the prophet Jeremiah, and that's whom I'm going to be looking at this morning. Uh, Jeremiah was a prophet who had a bitter pill, really, to swallow. Um, It was said of Jesus, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. And um, Jeremiah had a pill of suffering. Um, that he had to sort of eat in his ministry because not only did he foretell uh, the destruction of Jerusalem, his home city, and the people of God going into exile, but also uh, he was going to witness it all. Uh, so it was, it, was, it was a tough thing for him. This is just a little background. Um, in a minute, we're going to look at Jeremiah 31. But basically, the problem with the people of Judah, who were in the southern kingdom, who um, were based around Jerusalem with two tribes, uh, Judah and Benjamin, it was the same problem with the people of the north, was uh, Israel, the ten tribes, was that they basically traded belief in the living God for the gods of the surrounding nations. And consequently, the judgment on them was this. You will now be banished to a land of the gods that you want to follow. That was the judgment that was going to come upon them. And Jeremiah, as Isaiah before that, and Ezekiel and the other prophets all had the same message. And uh, Jeremiah uh, suffered because the first king that he was under was a man called Josiah, who was a good king. He tried to bring in some reforms. In the end, he he made a mistake and tried to um, go uh, into battle against the Egyptians, and he was killed. From then on, things went downhill. And uh, the next major king after Josiah was a man called Jehoiakim, who was put in place by the Egyptians, who were then sort of over, over, uh, in one sense, the kingdom of Judah. And uh, Jeremiah prophesied to people and, and the kings who just really couldn't care less what he was saying. In fact, uh, one of the tragic stories, and you can read it in the book of Jeremiah, is when he wrote out his prophecy on a long scroll, and it was taken to the king Jehoiakim in his palace. It was winter time. And the king had a fire burning, and as he received the scroll, he got a knife, and uh, he sliced it into pieces, and in utter contempt, put it into the fire. That's how he treated the Word of God. And, uh, and at the same time, he was beginning to worship other gods from the surrounding nations, and he uh, got some forced labor to build his nice palace. He was an unpleasant king. And he turned the hearts of the people away from God. And Jeremiah had to watch all this happening. And then after the other main king, after Jehoiakim, as Andrew mentioned last week, the last king of Judah was a man called Zedekiah. He was a weak man. Uh, He wanted to hear what God had to say through Jeremiah, but at the same time, he was afraid of his officials. And so he had Jeremiah... Uh, Jeremiah at this time was saying, if you surrender to the Babylonians, who were the invading force, then uh, you'll be okay. Well, the people thought, well, this guy's becoming a traitor, a turncoat, Um, so we shouldn't listen to him. Well, so he was put in prison, poor Jeremiah, and then he was thrown down a cistern. And in the end, he said to Zedekiah, yeah, I'll tell you the word of God, but please protect me. 
So it was a tough lot. And then we know what happened, and Andrew mentioned it last week. The Babylonians came right in, took the city, and Zedekiah had his son slaughtered in front of him, his eyes put out, and then they were all taken into exile. So sad times. But in the middle of Jeremiah prophesying all this doom and gloom and the judgment of God, he has a ray of hope. And uh, there are three chapters in in Jeremiah, and we're going to look at one of them this morning, where he sees beyond all this to when God is going to bring the people back to the land. And prophetically, he's looking even further into the future when there's going to be a new covenant And that's in the passage we're going to read. So, um, if you've got a Bible or you've got your mobile device with your Bible on it, turn please to Jeremiah chapter 31. And uh, we're going to read bits of it. Now, this is an interesting chapter. Um, Andrew talked about dreams, which was very appropriate because in the first half of this chapter... Jeremiah is asleep and he's having a dream, and it's a pleasant dream. Um, it's nice when you have a pleasant dream, isn't it? Do you ever get that experience when you wake up and you've, you've just been dreaming something really pleasant? And it's even better when you think, actually, this could really happen. And uh, Jeremiah has a dream, and, um, and then God actually comes in and speaks to him uh, after that dream. This chapter speaks about God bringing the people back, and it's a wonderful uh, message of hope. But in the middle of it, there's a rather strange passage where God taught, where, where the prophet, in his dream, sees the people, first of all, going into exile and then coming back again, when they turn in their own hearts back to God. And I've called this uh, talk today, you know, a prodigal people becomes a blessed people. Most of us will, be a, will know the story of the prodigal son who went off to a far country and spent his father's inheritance. And then he found himself in a field of pigs, eating the pig's food. And he came to his senses and he came back to God. This story we're about to read is, uh, and echoes that because the people come to their senses And so, I'm going to read from uh, verse 15. Um, It should appear on the screen. This is the story of them going into exile, but coming back into their senses. Verses 15 of chapter 31 to verse 22. This is what the Lord says. A voice is heard in Ramah, mourning and great weeping, Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because her children are no more. This is what the Lord says. Restrain your voice from weeping and your eyes from tears, for your work will be rewarded, declares the Lord. They will return from the land of the enemy. So there is hope for your future, declares the Lord. Your children will return to their own land. I have surely heard Ephraim's moaning. You disciplined me like an unruly calf, and I have been disciplined. Restore me, and I will return, because you are the Lord my God. After I strayed, I repented. After I came to understand, I beat my breast. I was ashamed and humiliated, because I bore the disgrace of my youth. Is not Ephraim my dear son, the child in whom I delight? Though I often speak against him, I still remember him. Therefore, my heart yearns for him. I have great compassion for him, declares the Lord. Set up road signs. Put up guideposts. Take note of the highway, the road that you take. Return, O virgin Israel. Return to your towns. How long will you wander, O unfaithful daughter? The Lord will create a new thing on the earth, a woman will surround a man. So, this little passage talks about, uh, just put the next slide up please, Michael. This little passage talks about, thank you, um, the people going into exile and then 
having a heart change while they're there and coming back. So there's the pain of judgment in the first part of the chapter, uh, the portion I've just read. A voice is heard in Ramah, mourning and great weeping. Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because her children are no more. What's this about? It's uh, Rachel, if you remember, was one of Jacob's wives, and she had Joseph, was one of her sons. Joseph had two sons in Egypt, if you remember, Manasseh and Ephraim. Ephraim became, as it were, the representative of the people of Israel. And so, this, in his dream, Jeremiah is seeing Rachel, whose tomb was in this place, Ramah, a few miles north of Jerusalem, weeping. Why is she weeping? Because she sees her descendants are going to go into exile. They're going to be taken away from their own land. And she's weeping about that. But we see that the people begin to have a heart change. Like the prodigal son, as I said, in the pig field, they begin to recognize that they've strayed. They've gone away from God. They beat their breast. They're ashamed. They're humiliated. And we see in verse 20... God, the Father, is looking out. You remember in the story of the prodigal son, the Father is waiting and he's longing and he's looking down the path. Will my son come back? And the people uh, are beginning to turn and God is watching. He has deep compassion for his people to return to him. And then they come back. And it's interesting, this little sign, he says, set up road signs. It's almost like as you go into exile, put some signs down back to Jerusalem because you're going to come this way and you will return to the place of your homeland. And uh, so it's a beautiful uh, passage. There's a rather strange verse at the end of this passage I've just read which says, the Lord will create a new thing on the earth, a woman will surround a man. What's that all about? It's about this, I think, that the people of God are represented by the woman, rather like we are the bride of Christ. Uh, the man is like the bridegroom, the Lord Jesus Christ. And what it's saying is that there's going to come a time again when the people of God will reach out to and cling on to God again. Um, beautiful picture, isn't it? And uh, Now, I don't know everybody here today, but it may be that you once had a faith in Christ, but it's become a little weak. It may be that you've never put your trust in Jesus, and you're a bit like the prodigal that's wandered off. Well, God is watching out for you to turn back to Him, just like these wayward people who were his people, whom he loved with an everlasting love. If that's you today, you can turn back to Jesus. Give your life to him afresh and come to know him. Don't hesitate. He's just a prayer away. Well, the rest of this passage, uh, just move it, uh, we're going to read the rest of the chapter now. And the rest of the chapter, which is rather lovely, is all about God's blessing for his people. Uh, one preacher said, some Christians, all they want is chocolates from the Lord. Sometimes he wants to give us chastenings. Well, we've had the little bit about the chastening. You're now going to get the chocolates, so enjoy them. But I'm just going to read the passage, and then I'll make... Uh, seven brief points, seven chocolates for you to eat and enjoy. So, chapter 31, beginning at the first verse, I'm going to read to verse 14, and then I'll read the, the bit after the bit I've just read. So, Jeremiah 31, verse 1. At that time, declares the Lord, 
I will be the God of all the clans of Israel, and they will be my people. This is what the Lord says. The people who survive the sword will find favor in the desert. I will come to give rest to Israel. The Lord appeared to us in the past, saying, I have loved you with an everlasting love. I have drawn you with loving kindness. I will build you up again, and you will be re rebuilt, O virgin Israel. Again, you will take up your tambourines and go out to dance with the joyful. Again, you will plant vineyards on the hills of Samaria. The farmers will plant them and enjoy their fruit. There will be a day when watchmen cry out on the hills of Ephraim, Come, let us go up to Zion, to the Lord our God. This is what the Lord says. Sing for joy for Jacob. Shout for the foremost of the nations. Make your praises heard and say, O Lord, save your people, the remnant of Israel. See, I will bring them back from the land of the north and gather them from the ends of the earth. Among them there will be the blind and the lame, expectant mothers and women in labor. A great throng will return. They will come with weeping. They will pray as I bring them back. I will lead them beside streams of water on a level path where they will not stumble because I am Israel's father, and Ephraim is my firstborn son. Hear the word of the Lord, O nations. Proclaim it in distant coastlands. He who scattered Israel will gather them and will watch over his flock like a shepherd. For the Lord will ransom Jacob and redeem them from the hand of those stronger than he, than they. They will come and shout for joy on the heights of Zion, they will rejoice in the bounty of the Lord, the grain, the new wine and the oil, the young of the flocks and herds. They will be like a well-watered garden, and they will sorrow no more. Then maidens will dance and be glad, young men as, and old as well. I will turn their mourning into gladness. I will give them comfort and joy instead of sorrow. I will satisfy the priests with abundance, and my people will be filled with my bounty, declares the Lord. And then picking up in verse 23. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says when I bring them back from captivity. The people in the land of Judah and its towns will once more, once again, use these words. The Lord bless you, O righteous dwelling, O sacred mountain. People will live together in Judah and in all its towns, farmers, and those who move about with their flocks. I will refresh the weary and satisfy the faint. At this I woke and looked around. My sleep had been pleasant to me. So he's now woken up from his pleasant dream, and then God goes on to speak directly to him. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will plant the house of Israel and the house of Judah with offspring of men and animals, just as I watched over them to uproot and to tear down and to overthrow, destroy, and bring disaster, so I will watch over them to build and to plant, declares the Lord. In those days, people will no longer say, the fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. Instead, everyone will die for his own sin. Whoever eats sour grapes, his own teeth will be set on edge. The time is coming declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their forefathers when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt, because they broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after this time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God, and they will be my people. No longer will a man teach his neighbor or a man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, because they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. And I'll stop there. It's a beautiful passage of God's blessing that he wants to bring to his people. And I just want to give you seven brief points in this uh, period of restoration. I'll just move it on, please. Thank you. 
this period of restoration and the new covenant. And here they are. The first point is this. God wants to have a family. And He wants you and me to be a part of it. Young and old and everything in between. God wants a family. See, this passage, it's, it's interesting. It talks about in the verses 3 and 4 that God is a lover to His people. He's like the one who woos his people to himself. Um, but then it goes on to say later on that he's a husband to his people. This is interesting, isn't it? He's the lover, the bridegroom, and then the husband. There's a beautiful verse in the Song of Songs which says, I belong to my lover, and his desire is for me. God's desire is for you. He is a husband to his people. But he's also a father to his people. Ephraim is his son. We are his children. Every one of us. We are the special object of his care and his concern. So God wants to have a family and he wants us to be covenanted to himself. It's not a contractual arrangement. You know, if you take out a mortgage or you buy a house or whatever, you sign various legal documents. No, this is a covenant. And it's like a marriage is a covenant. And when two people get married, they exchange rings. The ring is a sign of the covenant. It's got no break in it, has it? It's something that goes on and on forever. It's a covenant that you've made with your spouse. And God has made a covenant with you and me. We belong to Him. We're in His family. What a wonderful thing. And then, moving on to my next point, He has written His law in our hearts and put it in our minds. If you remember, Moses at the foot of Mount Sinai was given a couple of tablets of stone. He went up the mountain and on the top, the finger of God wrote out God's law on those tablets of stone. And he took it back down the mountain and God said, if you obey what's written on the tablets, you can be my people. If you disobey, you will suffer consequences. Well, unfortunately, they did disobey, didn't they? And we would have done the same had we been in their shoes. But now, God is doing something new. He's saying, I'm going to take my law and I'm going to write it on your hearts. And I'm going to put it in your minds. Christians, people who believe in Jesus, have a desire from within to follow Him, to obey Him. You know, the Apostle Paul says that God is at work within us to will and to act for His own good pleasure. The prophet Ezekiel said, using another analogy, I'm going to take your heart of stone out and I'm going to put a heart of flesh in you, a heart that's sensitive to me. And this is all by the Holy Spirit. Because Ezekiel also said, my spirit will move you from within to obey me. You know, we have, as Christians, we have a wonderful uh, bias within us. And it's a bias towards God, put there by Him. So, that's the second blessing. Third one is that we should know Him. I love this, isn't it? And all this is taken up by the writer to the Hebrews, of course. But uh, no longer will a man teach his neighbor or a man his brother saying, Know the Lord, they'll, because they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest. Andrew said last week, you know, you can know about people. I mean, I have a great respect for Her Majesty the Queen. I don't know about you. Uh, but I've never met her personally. 
Anybody been to a garden party with the Queen? No hands? So I think uh, Yashan has. So he's not here today. But um, if you, even if you go to a garden party, you'd probably be grateful for a glimpse of her. I do have a friend in uh, 2012. I can't remember if that was her diamond celebration or whatever. But he was a member of the Dickens Club. And um, because it was also celebrating Charles Dickens' uh, centenary or something, uh, he got an invitation to Buckingham Palace. And uh, he went there, and he had the invitation, and he was told what to wear. When he got there, he was, you know, ushered in, and ultimately he was taken into the room. And uh, I think he bowed before the Queen and shook her white-gloved hand and had the opportunity just to say, congratulations, Your Majesty, on 60 years or whatever of your rule. But that was it. But um, wouldn't it be lovely, do you think, to be one of the Prime Ministers who has a, a, is it a weekly audience with the Queen? That would be rather special, wouldn't it? But we've got something, nothing against Her Majesty, but we've got something much more amazing here. 24-7 access to the King of Kings, Lord of Lords, God of Gods, the Creator of all things. He knows us, and we have some knowledge of Him, don't we? It's just our knowledge of Him is like a tiny thing, the tip of the tip of the iceberg. You know, God is eternal. You cannot exhaust your knowledge of God. And uh, we've, we're on a journey to know Him. And uh, we're going to spend the rest of eternity getting to know this amazing God. But, uh, you know, Moses, it was said of Moses that he went into the tent of meeting and he talked to God as a man would his friend. I love that. And Moses so wanted to see God. He said, he said to God, show me your glory. And God said, okay. I'll put you in the cleft of a rock and I'm going to pass by you, but you can't see my face. But he went by Moses and Moses caught a glimpse. Now, how hungry are you to see God, to know him? You know, Paul said, I count everything a loss compared with the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. And you know, it's, I could tell you this morning, and I, and I will, you know, we all need to be God-seekers and to spend some time with Him. But did you know that God is also seeking you? In Revelation, there's a verse, and I became a Christian on this verse, but it, it's not really for non-Christians, where Jesus says, I'm standing at the door of your life, and I'm knocking. If anyone opens the door... I will go in with him, go in, and I will eat with him, and he with me. You know, the Lord wants to have a meal with you, just you and him, an intimate meal, and he's ready to speak to you about whatever it is in your life that may be difficult right now. So God is seeking you as much as we should be seeking him. What a privilege to know him. And then he's given us forgiveness. I mean, this is amazing. I will forgive their wickedness. Not only that, and I will not remember their sins anymore. It's amazing. You know, when you and I die, we will stand before God. And uh, I don't know about you, we'll probably feel a little bit ashamed of some of the things we've done in our lives. And we may say to God, you know, I'm so sorry I did that X, Y, or Z. And you know, God will say, what are you talking about? I don't know what you're talking about. Because he's chosen not to remember. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Forgiveness, what an amazing thing. And then I've got three more points. If you could just move them on, please. Thank you. Three more points. God wants to give us joy in knowing Him. It's funny, in our pre-prayer time this morning, we were talking about exuberance. 
Uh, some people are full of snap, crackle, and pop. Um, I must confess I'm not one of them, naturally. It's not my personality. Uh, however, this is a wonderful passage. It talks about joy uh, in verse 4. Again, you will take up tambourines. I've never known anyone in this congregation, I think, uh, with a tambourine. Ah, oh, good, we found them. You're welcome to get a tambourine when we worship God. And they will go out to dance with the joyful. And um, we used to dance a lot, you know. We've suddenly become very staid before the Lord because we've got a lot to celebrate. And this is what's prophesied about these people. Sing for joy for Jacob. Shout for the foremost of the nations. Make your praises heard. Joy in the Lord. And uh, in verse 13, it talks about the maidens will dance and be glad, and the young men, I will turn their mourning into gladness. Uh, I will give them comfort and joy instead of sorrow. And the amazing thing about this joy is it's not dependent on what's going on. It's not dependent on our circumstances. This is joy in the Lord, and it's produced by the Holy Spirit in us. Uh, a few, a few uh, recently, I was driving to a meeting, and I, I knew this was potentially a difficult meeting I was going to. I don't know if you have any of these in your workplaces. I'm sure that you do. Anyway, I'd prayed a lot about it previously. I'd laid it before the Lord. And as I was driving along, I thought, well, I've done all the praying I need to do. I'll just pray in tongues now. And I was praying in tongues for a few minutes. And when I stopped praying in tongues, I felt something bubbling up inside me. And it was a song of joy. And I just started praising God. And that's what the Holy Spirit can produce in us. Not dependent on our circumstances. It's the joy which is supernatural. So he wants to produce joy. And then he wants to make us fruitful. And there's some beautiful images in this passage about fruitfulness. Again, you will plant vineyards on the hills of Samaria. The farmers will plant them and enjoy their fruit. Incidentally, I should have said that Jeremiah's vision is for all the 12 tribes of Israel to come back into their land, not just the bit that he was in. It's a, it's a wonderful, so it's the hills of Samaria were in the north where he was not living. But anyway, they're going to plant vineyards and enjoy their fruit. And uh, later on, it says uh, that, uh, let me just get there. Yes, they'll have flocks and herds. And uh, later on, it says that they're going to have grain, new wine, oil. All these things speak of the fruitfulness that God is going to bless the people with. Uh, animals, uh, herds, etc. And he's going to build them and plant them. And I just want to remind us of this. Jesus said to his disciples, and he says to you and me, you did not choose me, but I chose you. Can you know the rest of the verse? I chose you to go and bear fruit. Fruit that will last. And previously, in the same passage, he'd said, This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, so proving yourselves to be my disciples. Well, how does God want you and me to be fruitful? Uh, in the following ways, I want to suggest to you. Fruitful in our witness. We're all called to be witnesses for Jesus. And uh, you, you may not be a Billy Graham. You may not see... Hundreds turn to the Lord as a result of your witness. But you may give a word of testimony. You may speak to someone this week about Jesus. And you may help that person come a little bit nearer to him. That's all that God's requiring you to do. But that's fruitfulness. Another area of fruitfulness, and this is a biggie for us all, is you and I, just by our interaction with one another, are helping to disciple one another to become more like Jesus. 
you know, when you encourage someone, a brother or a sister in Christ, you are helping them to become a little bit more like Jesus. That's fruitfulness. Here's another thing. Your job of work. If you work um, and you're doing a good job, I'll tell you what, that is your service to God from Monday through Friday, and that pleases Him. That is fruitfulness. Please don't think that what you do outside of the church, God's not interested in. No, the kingdom of God covers everything, and it covers your workplace. However, your service within the church too, God wants to make you fruitful in that. And so, in all these different ways, we're called to be fruitful. And as we walk with Jesus, we will dis display his beautiful fruit as well, uh, the fruit of his Holy Spirit. Well, I'm coming to a close. Uh, my final one is this. God, in the new covenant, wants to constantly refresh us with the Holy Spirit. And this is beautiful. Uh, verse 9, they will come with weeping, they will pray and I will bring them back. I will lead them beside streams of water. Any echoes when Jesus said, if you're thirsty, come to me and drink. And those who drink, out of them will flow streams of living water by which he meant the Holy Spirit. And verse 12, this is beautiful. Uh, if I can just find it. Yeah, they will come. And the, yes, they will have the grain, the new wine, and the oil. And listen to this. They will be like a well-watered garden. Um, some of you may have watched uh, Jill's testimony where she said, you know, we're like the garden, and God is the gardener. Uh, in fact, there was a man called Colin Urquhart who wrote a book, My Father is the Gardener. And, you know, you and I are like God's garden. And he's wanting to tend it. And above everything else, he's wanting to water it. I don't know whether you ever go on holiday to places like Greece. Uh, one of my favorite holidays is a Greek island. Uh, but sometimes I've been to India and seen this too. In the morning, as you may be on the balcony of your hotel, you see down below somebody with a, a, a hose pipe. And there's a nice patch of grass, and they've just got the hose pipe on there flooding it with water. And you know, God wants to flood you and me with the water of his spirit. Because we all get weary, don't we, at certain points. Sometimes we get stressed. Sometimes we feel nobody understands actually what I'm going through at this particular point in time. And it can be a lonely road that we walk. But God sees it all. And he wants to water you water you with his spirit, refresh you. If I can be a little bit irreverent for a moment, he wants to touch the parts that nobody else can touch. Refresh you in your innermost being and uh, with his life-giving spirit. Fill you afresh with him. Isn't it beautiful? I mean, God's done so much for us, hasn't he? So, I'll just end with this uh, verse from the Apostle Paul, if you could put it up, please. <clears throat> Thank you. This is what Paul said. He said, now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory are being transformed into his likeness with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. As we walk with Him, we are going to reflect His glory increasingly. Well, I don't know what I've shared that may have touched you this morning, um, but we're going to close with an old song that uh, Corinne's going to lead us, which is, Spirit of the Lord, fall afresh on me. And I'd like you to make this a prayer. And uh, as we just sing it, uh, Let's make it a prayer to the Lord and let's let the Holy Spirit minister to us and then may he lead us in fruitfulness into this coming week. Thank you.